after further review a Clemson student's perspective on sports. It's AFR time, baby. Let's get up. Let's get rolling. All right. Personal file. 69. Offense. He was giving them the business. He played it out. Okay, okay, so if Trevor Lawrence isn't either the second or third string quarterback in the fall, I shave my head and you get a henna well, tattoo. You gotta get a head tattoo. You gotta shave your head. Get a head tattoo. Head tattoo. Head tattoo. Now we're talking. And get a head tattoo. What a good personal foul. I'll pick this up. On number 99 of the defense, F3 tackle the quarterback. He's giving them business down there. That's a 15 yard penalty. And now your host, Jay Bradley and Evan. Well, good morning. AFR is on the radio. You know what time it is. It's 11 a.m. Saturday morning here at the WCCP 105.5 The Roar Studios. I'm Jay Smith alongside Bradley Kendall, Evan McDowell. Another episode of After Further Review for you this morning. Got a lot of, uh, well, a couple different topics we want to talk about this morning. Bradley got ACC preview, and we got some student ticket news. But uh, we'll start with the ACC, and we'll dive right into it. Bradley, after further review. Well, you've heard all the other opinions on the ticketing process. Now it is time to hear it from a student's perspective. So the people that are affecting, we get to hear what we think about it, uh, what we think is uh, great about it, what we think is not, and if we would make any changes. And we've had several of our uh, fellow students, friends of ours. That oh, yeah, have, everyone's voicing their opinion. Yeah, definitely um, voiced their opinions on the updated policy. And I know that Out of Bounds has spoken with a couple people involved with the athletic department at Clemson Lee Joe Galbraith was on their show a couple of days ago, so I was able to listen to some of that interview. Uh, some really interesting insights. But Evan, we're going to start off ACC preview 2018. Now, are we just going to go down the pecking order, or um, like hopefully the entire ACC conference schedule? It shouldn't matter um, because it should be a one dog fight. Everyone's playing for second at this point. You would hope. You, you would hope. So. I mean, if we, it all goes as planned, we would hope. I don't. I don't know if. People up north or farther south would hope that it's a one-horse race, but it should be. Clemson should be that good. The Coastal, I think, will be more competitive yeah, than the Atlantic. I think there's still some intriguing storylines around the conference, even though we've talked about this uh, quite a bit, that Clemson really has the firepower to run away with it this year. Um, although sometimes when you think you've got it all figured out, you end up not having it all figured out. Um, but I guess you know we can just start off. Evan mentioned up north. We can start off with Boston College. Last year, they were 7-6. and six. They finished 4-4 in the ACC. They did lose to Iowa in the pinstripe bowl, but they do have a few key games here this coming fall. One of them that stands out to me is at Purdue. And then you have other games like at, Penn, at NC State. Uh, they host Miami and then on the road at VT, and then they will host Clemson. So, Bradley, which one of those games do you feel like is the most significant which, which game do they have the most to gain, gain if they win for BC? I'm just happy this Clemson game for them is not on a Friday night, especially for our sake, too, because we hate those Friday night games, especially up in, uh, up in Chestnut Hills. But uh, I think the one game for them that they really have a great chance is at Florida State. They came off a, what was it, a... 38 to 3 win or 35 to 3 win last year against the Knolls. Um, State's going to be big too. If they want to make any noise um, this year in the Atlantic, they're going to have to take down teams um, outside of Clemson like NC State. Uh, and on the road, it's going to be very tough. That Purdue game could be a little uh, preview of another pinstripe bowl this year if they were to return to that. Um, I like Boston College. I think that's going to be one of Clemson's uh, most intriguing games this year, um, especially up north. I think A.J. Dillon is a Heisman contender that no one's really talking about, um, coming off a great freshman campaign. Um, like Evan was saying earlier, it's going to be tough because a lot of teams will probably pound the box uh, and try to focus solely on him. I think Anthony Brown has the chance to um, be a pretty decent quarterback after a solid freshman campaign. It was a little up and down. Um, but they're a very talented and experienced team and have a lot of chemistry, and I think they got a good chance to make some noise. Yeah, I think, you know, playing up in Chestnut Hill is never easy. I don't care how good that team is. I don't care if Matt Ryan's in his prime or not. Like, playing up at Boston College, for some reason, is a tricky situation. So I think that could potentially be one of Clemson's toughest games. Um, I don't really care about the Purdue game because it's non-conference, and I don't think Purdue's going to be that good. So I think for Boston College, their most important game is going to be that Clemson game because they have nothing to lose and everything to gain from winning that game. You lose that game, and everybody goes, well, it was Clemson. We didn't really expect you to win that game. You win that game at home, all of a sudden you can change the entire dynamic of the Atlantic Division. And as good as A.J. Dillon is supposed to be, I'm going to be, like you said, Bradley, I'm going to be watching the quarterback, Anthony Brown, a little bit closer because because I think a lot of their success is going to depend on his consistency because everybody is going to know how good A.J. Dillon is. They're going to know, hey, we got to stop that guy. 
What are you going to do when the ground game doesn't work? How is Anthony Brown going to respond? His statistics favor, I think, uh, Matt Ryan just a little bit in that his freshman year, Anthony Brown's freshman year last year, 1,300 yards, 11 touchdowns, 9 picks. I think that's pretty comparable to Matt Ryan's sophomore year, 1,500 yards, 8 touchdowns, 5 picks, and then Matt Ryan's junior and senior year were just, he played out of his mind. But not saying Anthony Brown is Matt Ryan, but it bodes well for him. I don't know if I really buy the whole home games for BC are the most important because y'all both have touched on the fact that it's hard to play up in Chestnut Hill. Okay, that's great, and they may have a good It's hard for other teams to play. Well, they may have a good chance. Maybe they have a chance at beating Miami or Clemson at home for them. I think really the more important games for them are on the road at NC State, at Virginia Tech. That's going to be a rowdy environment. If BC at Florida can, State. If, yeah, at Florida State. If BC can go down to to schools like Virginia Tech and Florida State, and they, they may not be able to win, but if they can at least hang around, it may raise some eyebrows. I think performances, good performances at those kinds of environments weigh a lot more than hosting Miami and Clemson and then getting beat by three touchdowns. Because I just don't think that they're going to be able to overcome any of these opponents on the schedule. But remember, that Clemson game is November 10th. Up in Boston College, that's going to be cold. That'll be a very tough game for. And you both know, teams. you know that'll be a night game. Oh, that's of that's going to be a night game. And I think their home games are significantly more important than those road games because if it is so tough to play up in Chestnut Hill, why don't you prove it to us? Why don't you beat Miami by double digits? Why do you beat Clemson by a field goal? And let's really see what happens. Why don't let's you make not get really shut out fifty-six nothing. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Speaking yeah. of Clemson, let's go to our Tigers now. Last year, we all know how Alphabetically, they en- of course. ended up. They were twelve and two, went seven and one ACC play. Uh, and then lost to Bama in the college football playoff. But they have a lot of key games this coming season. Obviously, the one that sticks out is on the road at A&M to, to second week of the season. But then you've got uh, NC State at home. You're trialing to FSU and then South Carolina at home. And then you also have Louisville at home somewhere in there. So, Bradley, which games stick out to you? Is it the non-conference games with on the road at A&M and South Carolina, two SEC opponents? Or is it the ACC play that you think means more? I think you got to go ACC. I think the A&M game is going to still be too early for Jim Fisher to really get any traction um, out in College Station. I think Clemson's going to win that pretty handily, I would think. Um, South Carolina's late in the year if you give Will Muschamp a so whole other season. So if you lose that A&M game and you win all of your ACC, well, what, what I'm saying is, is if you lose the A&M game and then you win all of your ACC play, does that still get you in the playoffs? Oh, if Clemson loses one game and wins the ACC, they're going to get in. There, there's no so question the ACC about that. ACC carries that much clout. You don't think having two wins against SEC schools, one on the road, one at home, would, would be just I mean, as- it carries weight, but I think if, if Clemson was still able to run through the ACC, no problem, and win the conference championship, I think they're sitting pretty like they did last year. I, th- I think it would speak many more volumes to run the October 20th through November 17th gauntlet of NC State, Florida State, Louisville, Boston College, Duke. I think that is going to be more important than... That's a lot of love for the Blue Devils. Well, I think they're going to be good. You have I to think, have some love. We'll talk about them in a minute. But I think if you're going to play two SEC schools, well, let's compare the top of the SEC to the bottom of the SEC. It'd be different if you were playing like an LSU and a Bama, but now you're playing A&M in South Carolina. Not to take anything well, away just, from those you, teams. You, I just don't think it would mean as much as if you I played mean, I a think, top non-conference opponent. It's pretty opponent. naive to sit here and pretend like a and not going to have it out for Clemson with Jimbo being there. It's going to feel like a rivalry game even though it may not necessarily for Clemson and their fans. But I think A&M, at least if, you know, if you're Jimbo, you're probably going to have a chip on your shoulder. You're going to want to win that game. I don't even need to sit here and explain to you how badly South Carolina wants to beat us at home to close off the year. It will so happen, my, <laughs> uh, It's a rivalry game. My argument it is— It was last year and the year before that. And my argument that is— well, you look at it historically, and it's hard for Clemson and South Carolina to, to string together four or five wins against each other. At some point, it's going to break. That's not what I'm saying, though. My point is is that these games against the SEC, one's on the road to kind of start the season, one is obviously at home to finish the season, could mean more in the committee's eyes than blazing through an ACC schedule that really, we've talked about this, is not that good. It's, it's not. It's not that great. And I think Evan's point is good when he says that that what, last little Wait. gauntlet. Well, no, you, yeah, you finish, but like the end of the year, that I know well, like Louisville might have a down year, and Florida you, State. Don't, you don't think Duke's going to be very good. Florida State's going to win seven or eight very games. Good. I'm just saying that like you're not. That's not a a game that the committee is going to look at and be like, oh gosh, Clemson beat Duke Home against NC State. NC State, maybe. You, you but, think but that second to last week having Bama beat Chattanooga is going to look better than Clemson it's Bama, beating Duke? It's Bama. We all know about the Bama bias. Now, if we lose in that last Keep couple weeks, that's yeah. different. But those if we games, win, it's still going to well, look good. That's why I say those games are significantly more important than the A&M or really the South Carolina game because we've seen you can lose a not Like if you schedule a non-conference game against somebody who's 
pretty good, respectable, like an A and M, like South Carolina. Like they're not bad teams. It's not like a Chattanooga, like you said. If you schedule those games and lose, it means a lot less than if you lose a conference game. Yeah. And in the committee's eyes, and just kind of across the board, like you need to win your conference games. Those are significantly more important to win than your non-conference games. Think about think about this. We got NC State on our tail pretty much the entire year. That's say a, we say we lose that game. because there are conferences. Like you could even say, I guess the Pac-12 or the Big 12, where winning your conference isn't necessarily enough. Well, it depends on how your conference is. So structured. you're saying the ACC is deep enough to where if you win the ACC and you lose a non-conference game, no matter who it's against, it's have not you, have you seen game? an ACC yes. champ not make the playoff yet? That would be a no, right? Every time the ACC an ACC team has won, which has been Clemson every time, Florida State, Florida State Could also affect your seeding. That's true. Yep. Um, it doesn't I mean, matter if you're in, you're in. First if you're, year, you're in, that's all that matters. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, seeding. But back to what I'd I was saying not before. Play Bama in the semifinals again, though. Oh, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> but I'd love to see it round four. Honestly, that I would just, be kind of fun. I think that the non-conference Settle games score. hold a little bit more intrigue. Um, but we got to switch over to Duke now, a team that Bradley obviously has a lot of passion for. Yeah, baby. Last year, seven and six, they were three and five in ACC play, and then they went on to beat Northern Illinois in the Quick Lane Bowl. Bradley, this is your baby, so why don't you tell them about? Duke is going to get a lot of hate from a lot of people just because historically they've been a pretty awful program. Um, but I think over the last few years, I think Dave, David Cutcliffe, and y'all can argue with me on this, I think David Cutcliffe has cemented himself as a top three, even top two ACC coach with what he's been given. Cutcliffe has really taken a team that historically has been awful and put him at 10 wins one year and had him win a couple bowl games over the last few years. And they have a guy that might get drafted in the top five rounds this year, and Daniel Jones. Not saying it'll happen, but I think he's got the because potential. Because Mark be. is new at Miami and Jimbo just left Florida State, I would agree with you. You should. I would. I, would I, would, I would. I wouldn't put him top two. Who are you going to put ahead of him? I like Mark Richt. Yeah, I he think hasn't done I'll, anything at Miami. He hasn't yet. done so anything. He's yet. a proven coach. No, no, no. no coaches in the ACC. But your argument a few weeks ago. He's when also we were at Miami. About proven coaches. What if they went to a different school? It's it's a whole other ball. Game. I don't remember making that argument. Anyway, Mark Rick is a good football coach. We know this. He coaches in the ACC. That's all I'm saying. If you okay. can take Duke to ten wins, you Duke got, to ten wins, you deserve to be I, top I, three. I agree at best. with Bradley I, here. I, I I like David Cutcliffe, and there is no question that he has done things with the Duke football program that are unheard of at that school, and he's done it much less in. Mike Krzyzewski's shadow. So it's commendable what he's done. But I think if you look at, I mean, I like Steve Adazio. I like Paul Johnson at Georgia Tech. Not so much the last couple of years, but there for a while, Georgia Tech was running the Atlantic Division or Coastal Division, Which whichever they were in much. at the time. Isn't yeah. saying much, but you're right. No, Paul Johnson's been around for a while. I, I do like Steve Adazio too. Um, I'm just saying I think it's close. I think it's I like, close, I, like, but I, I, like I think Justin, it's arguable that he's top three. I like Justin Fuente. I think, I think he's a young, promising he Virginia Tech coach. as much yet, though. Well, that's why I say he's young and promising. I was yeah, not saying so he's one of the best coaches. Exactly. He could yeah, be. He could be, but so he's not there I'm saying yet. it's close. If you're going to put Cutcliffe at two, three, four, and five are right there. Do whoever they are. Do we want to preview Duke. any games for Duke? Or are we just talking about coaches? Oh, uh, we've got to talk about the games. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. the, coach, the coach can only go so far, but you got to talk about some of the games in there. Um, I think I think Duke has the chance to really do pretty well this year. I think I had him going eight and four on our Instagram page. Seven and five is probably a little more realistic. Uh, they do have some tricky uh, non-conference games, one of them being at Northwestern, and we've talked about last week how good we think Northwestern could be this year. Um, at Baylor, looked a lot better a few years ago. That should be a win for them now. Um, they got some tricky games on the Coastal. They got to play at Pittsburgh, at Georgia Tech. They got Virginia Tech at home, mm -hmm. and then they got at Clemson. And Clemson, a team they have not played in a long time. Um, so I think there's going to be a couple toss-up games in there that you could see going Duke's way, um, but I think 7-5 and five for Duke is a, is a pretty decent year. I, yeah, I think Throwing anything a bowl above win, 500 eight five. For, for Duke is, is really solid. I think um, you would expect them to go 7-5, and five, but with the number of toss-up games they have, if the cards were to fall in the right places for the Blue Devils, they could win 10 games. I'm not saying they will, and it's not very likely, but they could. They could. They, they, could. Have, a, they have games in there where they have the chance to win the Coastal. Obviously, at They're, Miami is going to be right. tough. For Tech be They're going to need a lot to go right for them and a lot to go wrong for a lot of other people, yeah. but they, you could see double-digit wins in Durham this well, year. Well, we got to move on to Florida State now. Obviously, lots of questions there. Willie Tyrett's taken over for Jimbo. They were 7-6 and six last year. Scrape and clawed their way into a bowl game, went on to defeat Southern Miss in the Independence Bowl. Shouldn't have even been a bowl game, first of all, because they played Louisiana Monroe in the last week of the season. But they are, from what I have read, they're going to a more up-tempo offense under Taggart. Will that, Bradley, give them the edge in some games in the ACC this year? I think it could. They have the players to do it. I think that's a smart move by Willie Taggart because he's got a lot of athletic guys out there in Tallahassee, one of them being Francois, who's now coming back. Cam Akers, who's one of the best running backs in the ACC. I, mean, I think you kind of need a switch. They're almost kind of like LSU where they were very um, kind of cut and dry, very slow, and now they're trying to move things up a little bit and change up the pace a little bit. So I, th I think that's good. 
Seven and five, eight and four is probably more realistic for them, but you never know with those games. It's, a, it's a rebuilding year. It is. It's a rebuilding, it's a rebuilding year. year for yeah. them, which is different for their fan base. Uh, Evan, you got any thoughts on FSU? I think they easily make a bowl game. I think, again, a lot would have to go right for them and a lot would have to go wrong for a lot of other people. They could potentially win the Atlantic. Other than them, I don't see anybody but Clemson winning the Atlantic. So if things go catastrophic for Clemson and everything goes phenomenal for Taggart and company down there, I know he's got Francois and Cam Akers coming back offensively, we talked about. Defensive line to Marcus Christmas, Brian Burns. So they, sh- they should be easily in a bowl game, like I said, but they're going to need a lot to go right if they want to compete in the Atlantic. All right, looking at Georgia Tech, last year they were 5-6, and 4-4 six, four and four in ACC play. And Paul Johnson has kind of, I mean, we've taught him, he's been Georgia Tech, it feels like forever, but they haven't really ever been able to get to that point where they kind of get over the hump. Bradley, yeah. you feel like this is the year for them or just more of the same? I think they got a good chance. I like Georgia Tech this year. They had a lot of close games last year that didn't fall their way. Tennessee week one, 43-42. The Miami game, they lost by one. Clemson, they kept close. I love Taquan Marshall. I think this system works. Paul Johnson's proven it works, and I think he's the right quarterback to do it. They got a new defensive coordinator to fix that side of the ball, and nearly the entire offense returns. So I think Georgia Tech, if they have a lot of those close games go their way, you could be looking at an eight-win team this year, maybe even nine. A couple of tough games. Georgia Tech, for me, is just always hard to predict because I'm used to them you know, being good, competing for the ACC, and in the past couple of years, they just haven't. So they, you know, they could either go six and six or like eight and uh Four. I can't do math. Yeah, yeah whatever. You can do it. Eight, four. I'm, I <laughs> never it's summer break. Too, yeah. early, too early for So, him. yeah, if they iron out some of those wrinkles, like in their close games last year, losing by one to Tennessee, Miami, and then losing by two touchdowns to Clemson, if they can find a way to close out some of those games, yeah, you could see them knocking on the door of nine wins, potentially. Speaking of maybe knocking on the door of nine wins, Louisville last year was knocking on the door of nine wins. They finished eight <laughs> Not and this year. five. <laughs> 4-4 four four ACC play, but they did lose to Mississippi State in the Gator Bowl, and like Bradley just alluded to, I don't think they're going to have that great of a year. They open against Alabama. I believe that game is in... So they're already 0-1. The game yeah, hasn't but been where is that game yet, play? That's a neutral. I think it's in like Atlanta. I'm pretty sure it's somewhere neutral. Is it? Maybe okay, Texas. Somewhere yeah, it's it's in neutral. Uh, but Atlanta. then they got Florida State at Clemson, NC State. Lots of questions. Replacing Lamar, obviously, is going to be difficult. So here's a, here's any a great thoughts point. on that? They have an entire starting defense this year. With no seniors. So they're going to be super, super inexperienced and immature this year. Well, and it's not like their defense was anything spectacular anyway. So, I mean, it helps. But when if you don't have great players coming back, it doesn't help that much. And losing a Lamar Jackson, that's going to be hard to replace. They couldn't block for anybody with Lamar Jackson. I wet highly doubt that. Right? The wet yeah, exactly. Bag of off, exactly. Off yeah. Line. Yeah, I should trademark that. One but, more. One, well, go ahead. Finish that point. Well, I, I mean, I was, I was just going to say they were... You know, good enough with Lamar. No, Lamar. I just don't think they're gonna be. I wouldn't be surprised if they miss a bowl game. One more quick team before we cut to break. Miami. Last year they were ten and three, seven and one in ACC play. They lost to Wisconsin in the Orange Bowl, which was a home game for them. Got any love for the Canes this year, Bradley? I don't. I think nine wins, maybe, but I just do not like Malik Merger. I, I don't like the way they closed out last season. I think it's gonna carry over into this season. Mark Rick's a good coach, but I think Miami's got to be real. They're not competing for a college football playoffs. Fairly manageable though, so it's I don't manageable. think they're gonna be competing for playoffs. Maybe I think they'll get eight or nine wins. What about you, Evan? They've got to be more consistent. Rozier has got to be more of a leader on that offense. He's just not. Uh, maybe maybe now that he has the experience, he'll be able to kind of you know get that poison leadership that they so desperately need out of that quarterback position. But I like Mark Rick. I think Miami will compete in the Coastal Division. I don't think they'll necessarily win it, especially with the way they closed out last year so poorly. So if they can stay more consistent, I think they've got a good shot. I just don't trust them to do that. Well, we got to cut to a quick break. When we come back, we will wrap up the rest of the ACC and then get into the real meat and potatoes of today's show, student tickets. Stick with us. Have you heard about the changes over at T.Ed Garrison Arena? They are now offering event space rentals for banquets, parties, fundraisers, weddings, and more in their air-conditioned 10,000 square foot newly renovated cattle sales complex. Also ask about their full-service RV sites for football tailgating. Convenient nine-minute drive to the stadium. Call 864-646-2717 today to pre-book. Space is limited and will sell out quickly. Go Tigers! This ad was funded by the City of Clemson Accommodations Tax. Summer's here, so before you put those toes in the water, the Pendleton Tire Company wants to make sure your tires are ready. The Cooper Tire Take the Money and Ride Summer Events going on right now through July 31st at the Pendleton Tire Company. Purchase four qualifying Cooper Tires and get up to a $100 Visa prepaid card after submission. So come on by and see Joey Welburn and Zach Garrison or give them a call today at 646-3694 and check them out at PendletonTire.com. 
It's your daughter's graduation party, but you're not sure what to serve your family and friends? Don't worry, Tom's Barbecue has your back. Tom's Barbecue serves hundreds of catered events and knows what the people want. Good food. Brock here, owner of Tom's Barbecue with my wife, Beth, and we understand the value of a great catered event. Whether it is a graduation party, wedding, company event, or birthday celebration, you name it, we can cater it. Give us a call at 864-288-2652. Tom's Barbecue at the corner of Woodruff and Garlington in Greenville. Are you able to navigate today's financial markets to secure your retirement future? The advisors at Kiwi Financial Group understand that you may reach a point in your life when you need answers to countless questions about retirement planning. The Kiwi Financial Group listens to your questions to understand your needs. Trust your financial future with the Kiwi Financial Group in Clemson. Call today at 654-5043 or online at kiwifg.com or visit our office on Pendleton Road next door to Max Driving. Men, are you tired of those daily blue enhancement pills that take days, weeks, or months to work if they ever work at all? Listen up. Now you can take Red, the new natural male empowerment pill that works on demand. Even your partner will notice the difference the very first time you use it. To prove Red won't disappoint like the others, you're invited to participate in our nationwide I Take Red Partner Reaction Guarantee Trial. We're seeking participants for this nationwide trial, not only to prove it works the very first time you try it. We guarantee your partner will also notice the difference. Forget those slow-acting blue pills and join those who proudly take red. Over 50,000 pills have already been claimed and supplies are limited. So to ensure your participation in this free nationwide trial, you must call now. Superior Virility On Demand. You only need to take red once to see what all the fuss is about. Call immediately to participate in our free nationwide trial. Call 800-645-4371. That's 800-645-4371. Be one of thousands to proudly say, I take red. 800-645-4371. Do you need LED tube lights, floodlights, high bay, or canopy lights? Crute LED will pass on Duke Power rebates up front to you with a verification of your business's Duke Power bill. Visit online at CruteLED.com for more information or call 864-401-8506. Buying a mattress can be a difficult process, but that can all change with one visit to Engineered Sleep. They are a mattress manufacturer that opened their doors to the public. You get factory direct pricing, a mattress made just for you, and free delivery all over the upstate. Your mattress will be made and delivered within one to five days. It is always great to buy local, but when you buy from Engineered Sleep, you are truly buying from the best. Their showroom at 627 Congaree Road in Greenville is open Monday through Saturday. Sleep like a champion with your Engineered Sleep. Hiring a realtor shouldn't be as difficult as hiring a head coach. So don't be like Tennessee. Call me, Jana Candler, with the Totes team at Berkshire Hathaway Seed and Joiner, 864-313-6990. And now, back to Jay, Bradley, and Evan. Welcome back. We appreciate you spending your Saturday morning with us here on the radio. Going to dive back into some ACC preview. I believe we left off with North Carolina, Bradley. So let's How go. Much to say here? Yeah, let's go and talk about them for a second. They were 3-9 and nine last year, 1-7 ACC play. Uh, is there anything good to say about the Tar Heels There's future? Not. Just wait for basketball season. I think that's that's your best bet at this point. Uh, they're going to have some decent players. Anthony Ratliff-Williams is a pretty decent wide receiver. Um, Chas, Sash Sherrod, I know they're really raving about um, in Chapel Hill. They're looking for that replacement uh, for the last couple uh, good quarterbacks they have that have been drafted. Um, it's This is the one stat I thought kind of stood out after their 11-3 and breakout year in 2015. They've gone 8-5 mm-hmm. and five and 3-9. and nine. So Larry Fedora, that seat is definitely heating up year in and year out now. Um, the quarterback battle, they don't even know who's going to be starting. Um, really, what has happened to Carolina? I mean, they was, used to be a pretty decent program. Uh, they were in the ACC championship just a few years ago. That just felt like yesterday. And now and I'm sure plummeted. I'm sure now you're loving it. Oh, Duke's, sure Duke's going right eight now. and four and Carolina's going three and nine. I mean, there, there's not much better yeah, than that. I, I think Larry's out of there before the end of the year. Honestly, I don't think it's going to get any better. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Evan, uh, I think that Larry's going to be gone. I mean, I think they got to at least make a bowl game for him to feel some inkling of job security, even though Is in reality possible? he doesn't really have it. I mean, yeah. maybe. They gave, they gave up 31 points a game last year. No. Maybe. I, That's know. a lot. <laughs> yeah, it is. And like you said, since making the ACC championship two years ago, just hadn't quite quite got into that same groove and losing a quarterback like Mitch Trubisky does not help. So I no. think they have a lot to figure out. And if that involves getting a new coach, then so be it. I think that probably wouldn't be a terrible thing for the heels, but I, I could see them winning more than three games this year. And the schedule doesn't fare out easily. Yeah. They got to play central Florida week three at Cal to begin the year. Uh, Virginia Tech. A, 
Oh, at Cal? They're traveling to Cal? They're at California. Wow. So that's, that's a, a nice that's little, a little, nice little vacation, though. Nice a little weekend at, trip to... Yeah. Extra oh, off-season well, trip well, there. Yeah. Sticking in the state of North Carolina, let's move on to NC State. Had a little bit more success last year. They were 9-4, and 6-2 and two in ACC play, and then they went on to beat Arizona State in the Sun Bowl. Uh, they will be playing at Clemson this season. They're going to host Florida State, travel to Louisville, and then obviously they will travel to UNC. You feel like this maybe is a good year for the Wolfpack? I think it's got to be. If Dave, Dor- Dave Dorn is going to stick around. Well, they haven't gone back-to-back nine-win seasons since, I believe, the 90s. I think it was 91 and 92. 91 92, which is a long time. So it's I mean, been for, a minute. For a program that's been can, waiting for that one big they year. Can su- sustain the success, Evan? I think, I mean, the pieces are there. They have arguably the best quarterback in the conference in Ryan Finley. They have a really solid wide receiver in Kelvin Harmon. Uh, I think Dave Doran has done a pretty good job of making them at least a notable Atlantic opponent the past couple of years. I think they have the potential to be the second best team in the Atlantic. And again, a potential to come into Death Valley. And if the wind's not blowing to the right too hard, they could, (laughs) you know, end up pulling the upset. But I think, again, they're going to have to get pretty lucky in a couple of spots to really makes some significant noise as far as an ACC championship is concerned. What do you think, Bradley, of the Ryan Finley to Russell Wilson comparison? Um, I think it's you got to look at it in a different light than you would a guy that's been there for all four years because Russell Wilson did switch over to Wisconsin, yep. I believe, for his which, senior year. So I think he's very talented. Finley's he prides himself on great completion percentage and just being really efficient, and that's something that NC State's really going to need this year. Uh, but I, I do like the, the debate where we had Ryan Finley and uh, Kelvin Harmon of the best – quarterback wide receiver duo in the ACC because I think Finley is that good uh, and if he has a replicated year of last year you could be looking at a maybe a nine and three year for NC State so but that Clemson game is going to be huge that'll yeah. be what determines their their fate at the end looking at Pitt now they were five and seven last year in three and five in ACC play they I really to be honest I don't know a ton about Pitt I just haven't really been paying attention to them they do have some tricky road games this year. They're going to travel to Notre Dame. They're going to travel to Wake Forest, and then they're going to travel to Miami. So the road schedule is not too inviting. And we've kind of talked about Bradley a little bit. Wake Forest may be a dark horse, potentially. They potentially could be. That'll be a tough game for any team in the ACC. I like the headline on Pittsburgh, though, on uh, Athlon Sports. It said, play like that every week. And that being referred to as the Miami game from last year. They've got potential. Kenny Pickett came in last year um, after placing their starter from about half the season, and he actually performed pretty well. Um, brought that team up to uh, five and seven on the year, which is not that great, but from where they started, it was a lot better. Um, what they're going to have to really focus on is the pass defense. They brought in the former linebackers coach at Northwestern to begin the job as the defensive coordinator. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that Pitt has the chance to win seven or eight games. It's probably not going to happen. Um, they also just, have the chance to finish below 500. They also do. Yeah, they're, so it's, it's going to be a very up and down season for them. Um, with a lot of games mixed in there that could go their way but could also not. Pitt, for me, is a lot like Georgia Tech in that their coach is all right. I don't really care for him. They're not going to be that great a team, but they're probably going to have at least one or two significant wins to ruin somebody else's season. CC, Miami, CC, Clemson. Because even though... You look at Pitt and go, yeah, that's that's probably a five and seven team. I think they could easily make a bowl game, and I think they could easily, you know, if they wanted to and played well enough, they could be like they play Penn State. I think they could beat them again. They got Miami last week of the year. We saw how well that worked out for the Hurricanes not that long ago. So, again, if they if they get lucky and stay consistent, Pitt could be a seven or eight win team, but I don't think they will be. That non conference schedule just so tough though. Penn yeah. State and at UCF, so. that's just not easy. Syracuse now they last year they were four and eight, two and six in ACC play. Uh, they are on a four-year bowl drought, and yeah, the orange, third year for Dino Babers now. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't know. I mean, is his seat getting warm? You think? Eric Dungy's the quarterback he wants. Uh, he had a lot of concussion problems last year. They've got some playmakers. Um, they had a couple really good standout wide receivers last year that really uh, were able to help them out on the offensive side. Like I said, they just got to stay healthy. Uh, the defense has got to perform well. They let up 162 points in their last three games of the season. So nothing to be excited about there to close out the 2017 campaign. Uh, I think Babers is a decent coach. I think for Syracuse football, making a bowl game, it would be a monumental achievement for them. I don't think it'll happen this year, but I think they got the chance to in the uh, upcoming seasons. I don't think Dino Baber's seat is that hot yet. I think they like him there, and I think there's a lot of potential going forward. But, I mean, it's tough to be in a division with Clemson, Florida State, Louisville, and NC That's State. not easy as a, as a bas- pr- predominantly basketball school, I mean, kind of like Duke. It's just, it's hard. And I think Dino Baber's 
uh, similar to David Cutcliffe, but not on that same level, is doing the best with what he's got. It's just not a destination for football. It's no, just don't, it's not. They're yeah. trying to make it, but it's just not going to be. You can't now, get excited about playing difficult. a game in the carrier dome. Like, beating, you just Clemson, can't do it. beating Clemson looks great on social media, and it looks great for him under his resume, but you got to do more than you just gotta, that Yeah, one you got to get more than a fluke win. So for me, they're a lot, I think they're, I would, categorize them the same as a Pittsburgh or a Georgia Tech. Then mm. They might not have that great of a year, but they could also ruin somebody else's year. I would be shocked if they made a bowl game, but uh, you know, it's going to be a two-win improvement to try to make a bowl game. That's an uphill battle. A lot to ask. Three more teams to get to. Virginia, last year they were 6-7. and seven. They went 3-5 and five in conference play, and then they lost to Navy in the military they bowl. They got smoked by Navy in the military bowl. It was like 48-3. <laughs> yeah, it was It was not a, not a good performance. Uh, and then the offensive and defensive lines are going to really need to rebuild this year, but their secondary... <laughs> very deep. Very deep. I wish Clemson had a secondary. Like very Virginia's deep. We could easily use some of their players there. Uh, it's, it's the offense that's really going to uh, yeah. be the... Average less than 20 points. About 20 points right well, okay, there on the dot. 20.1. Yeah, so. 20. Bronco Mendenhall, I think he's I think he's doing a great job with, like you said, with what he's given. Six and seven last year. I mean, people forget Virginia was a bowl team last year um, after being pretty irrelevant in years past. So uh, the schedule looks pretty favorable. They have a very, very easy non-conference schedule. Um, but they do have to go to at NC State, at Georgia Tech, and at Virginia Tech. So that's going to be a tough way um, to sail around the ACC schedule, but I like Virginia. I think five or six wins is probably realistic again um, if Bryce Perkins can be that uh, good replacement at quarterback for them, but we'll see. I, I don't I don't like him too much, but there's there's light there. Vegas gives them an over-under of five games. I think that's fair. I think it's, it's very plausible to see them take the over there. Like you said, Bradley, not an incredibly difficult schedule, but having to replace Kurt Benkert and uh, you know their secondary is good, but other than that, a couple a couple pieces on the defensive line could be tough to to replace. But again, you're going to have to fight through Miami and Virginia Tech, and mm-hmm. you know one of those being a rivalry games and one of those being an up and coming Miami team. Like those are those are going to be hard teams to beat. And I think if Virginia wants to have any kind of chance at going for I don't know eight nine wins potentially winning the coastal, you got to beat both those teams. You and can't Mendel- split and Mendenhall said next year would be the year that people should judge him off because in the last couple of years, they've had the least amount of scholarship players at Virginia in the ACC. So he does not have a lot to work with there. As a team wow. that's never been known for being very good at football, he's made them respectable enough at football decent. for he's Virginia. Made, they beat Boise decent. State last year. I mean, that's yeah. pretty that's decent. Good yeah. enough. And again, a basketball what about, school. What about Virginia Tech? Last year, they were 9-4, and 5-3 and three ACC play, and then they lost to Oklahoma State in the Camping World Bowl. Uh, Fuente, you think he's going to get him back to nine wins, or do they slip a little bit? Got to be happy Josh Jackson's not on academic probation after what went down uh, in the offseason a couple weeks ago. Uh, replacing the Edmonds brothers is going to be tough. They left early for the draft. Um, Fuente is 19-8 and eight in his first two years, so not a bad replacement that they had up there um, at Virginia Tech, but 75% of their roster is a sophomore or younger. That's very young. And we talked about earlier with Louisville having a very young defense. It's going to be the same thing up in um, up in Blacksburg. So um, I think I think people might be overhyping Virginia Tech just a little bit. It's going to be tough. To I don't know, man. Fuente win. is he's nineteen. I don't know. You may have mentioned this, but he's nineteen and eight in his first two years at VT. So that's pretty. That's impressive. what they're looking for. They had the fourth impressive. best defense last year, so that'll yeah. that'll be tough to replicate. But if they can do anything close to that, I think. Have you got any thoughts on VT before we move on to Wake Forest? Uh, I like Virginia Tech, and I like Justin Fuente. I- I would like to say that they're going to win the Coastal, but I think Miami would probably talent-wise and experience-wise have a little bit more to offer than the Hokies, so I wouldn't be surprised if Miami wins the Coastal. Miami games at home, though. That helps them. I think it really does, but you also got to look at, I mean, at Duke, that might not be an easy win. At Pitt, we know, won't be an easy win. Um, other than at Florida State, they also, other they than start that, start the season at Florida State. Yeah, so that's I mean that's not an easy way to start the year, and I think that first game could mean a lot going down the stretch Absolutely. for the rest of the year. So I think you could see them win nine games again, but just the experience isn't there. I think next year Virginia Tech is going to be nasty, but this year they still might have a little bit to figure out. But I wouldn't be surprised at all if they keep Fuente around. He's, he's a yeah, so coach. I think he's, yeah. they I think need he's to hang on coach. to Justin Fuente great with coach. everything that they have. He is one of the best young coaches I think in the country. Last team in the ACC, Wake Forest. Last year they were eight and five, went uh, five hundred. ACC play at four and four, and then they went on to beat Texas A and M in the Belt Bowl. Any love yeah, great for in Charlotte. Wake Forest? Because I think this team yes. could potentially make some noise this fall. If Wake was in the Coastal, I might be picking them to win it, honestly. But uh, I think. I think Wake's got a really good chance to be good. Kendall Hinton was hurt last year, um, was replaced by John Wolford. Wolford was a very solid replacement. Hinton's back now after injury, um, and this team was 12th in total offense last season in the mm-hmm. entire country. Not bad at Wake Forest. Uh, Greg Dortch, I mentioned him early to Evan. Um, guy was a stud as a freshman at wideouts, had nine touchdowns in only seven games last year, so not terrible at all. The defense lost five starters. They're going to have to replace that. 
I think Wake's got a chance, like you said, with other teams before to ruin some people's season. Yeah, they may be hanging around in the fourth quarter of some games that you know, it's going to make other teams nervous. Well, and unlike some of these other teams that we just got done talking about that went 5-7, and 6-6, six and six, lost their bowl game, Wake messed around, won eight games, and beat a pretty good A&M team in the bowl game. So that's a really solid, impressive way to finish the year. They're going to have the best offensive line in the country, or not in the country, excuse me, in the conference. It could be in the country. It could honestly. be in the country. It really could. They have a ton of experience on that offensive line. Four fifth-year seniors, three of which were all ACC last year. So uh, I think... Ground and pound, run the ball. I was about to say, Hinton and running back Matt Cole we're going to have some great blocking. I think if Greg Dorch can stay healthy and Kendall Hinton can get the ball to him, that could be a lethal combination. And again, if they didn't have to fight through the Atlantic, this could be a really solid Wake Forest team. But because you got to go through, again, Louisville, Florida State, Clemson, NC State, it's going to be an extremely uphill battle for the Demon Deacons. But I would not be surprised if they won eight games again or even nine. It wouldn't be out of, my, out of, out of the picture I think for me. I think it's plausible. Um, yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, let's look at their schedule. Tulane win. Towson win. Boston College at home. Let's give them a win there. Notre Dame. Give them a Notre Dame win. Notre Dame toss-up, yeah. But no, we'll, I don't just know about for that. fun, That'll a win. Rice. Maybe. Rice is a win. They could come into the Clemson game 5-0. and oh. And then you got Clemson, Florida State, Louisville in a row. I think you win. They'll probably go one out of two. I was about to say, you win one, maybe two of those if you get lucky because Florida State, Louisville think, on the road. I think, like you both said, they Syracuse both have Syracuse at State, a uh, Pittsburgh at home, at Duke. So this is the back-loaded. Second yeah. half of the year is kind of tough. But, again, I could see them winning eight or nine games. We're going to cut to a quick break. When we come back, though, we'll wrap up the show with one final segment discussing the student ticket news that came out earlier this week. Stick with us. Have you heard about the changes over at T.Ed Garrison Arena? They are now offering event space rentals for banquets, parties, fundraisers, weddings, and more in their air-conditioned 10,000-square-foot newly renovated cattle sales complex. Also ask about their full-service RV sites for football tailgating. Convenient nine-minute drive to the stadium. Call 864-646-2717 today to pre-book. Space is limited and will sell out quickly. Go Tigers! This ad was funded by the City of Clemson Accommodations Tax. Local Q is the place to connect for food, friends, and fun. Have you made plans for brunch? Local Q has expanded their brunch menu to include a barbecue Benedict, house-made corned beef hash, and many more items to beat that hangover. Wash it down with a mimosa pitcher or our classic Bloody Mary. Keep the fun going with a little friendly competition. It could be one of their hundreds of nostalgic board games, pool, ping pong, Jenga, darts, or cornhole. Local Q, the place to connect for beer, barbecue, and board games. Hey, Tiger fans, this is Taj Boyd. Are you ready for your upcoming move? Relax, because my friends at Tiger Moving have been trained to quarterback their move for you. Skip the headache and the backache. Hire the clean-cut, athletic movers. They have the experience, attitude, and equipment to make your moving experience completely stress-free. Call today at 908-9028 or email tigermoving at gmail.com to book your next move with Tiger Moving of Greenville. Licensed and insured to operate in Greenville, Spartanburg, and Anderson Counties. Go Tigers! Buying a mattress can be a difficult process, but that can all change with one visit to Engineered Sleep. They are a mattress manufacturer that opened their doors to the public. You get factory direct pricing, a mattress made just for you, and free delivery all over the upstate. Your mattress will be made and delivered within one to five days. It is always great to buy local, but when you buy from Engineered Sleep, you are truly buying from the best. Their showroom at 627 Congaree Road in Greenville is open Monday through Saturday. Sleep like a champion with your Engineered Sleep. It happens every time. When a hailstorm hits, there's an increase of people who want to take your money for roof repairs. Problem is, many of them are just trying to take advantage of you and don't really know what they're doing. Gillstrap Roofing has been around for decades. Trust Gillstrap Roofing to handle the repairs and deal with the insurance. Just because someone knocks on your door with a card that says they're a roofer doesn't mean they'll do quality work at a reasonable price. Call Gillstrap Roofing, 269-1232. What if there was a paint that made you look at paint differently? One that completely rewrote paint's genetic code so it can strengthen any color. What if it's built with better ingredients, even given superpowers? Since Benjamin Moore reinvented the way paint is made, it makes you wonder, is it still paint? Benjamin Moore, paint like no other. The Carter Color Company, 1067 Tiger Boulevard, Clemson. Your independent local Benjamin Moore paint retailer. I'm a donut nut, I'm a donut nut, I'm a nut for Krispy Kreme. Hi, I'm Glenn Reese with Krispy Kreme Donut Company in Anderson and Spartanburg. We're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Drop by for a delicious donut and a cup of coffee. And remember, raise money for your club, church, or group of worthy cause. 
sell Krispy Kreme donuts. Call Anderson and Spartanburg Krispy Kreme. I'm a donut nut, I'm a donut nut, I'm a nut for Krispy Kreme. Calling all superheroes. Do you wish there was a way to make extra money while helping others in need? Now is your chance. Biotest Plasma Center in Clemson is seeking plasma donors who will be compensated for their time and travel. New donors can earn $50 on each of their first five donations. Repeat donors earn up to $310 a month. Walk-ins welcome. Become a superhero and save lives. Schedule your appointment and get more info at biotestplasma.com. Again, that's biotestplasma.com. And now, back to After Further Review. Welcome back. AFR is on the radio, and we've got time for one last segment this morning. And as Bradley said at the top of the hour, you've heard all the other opinions on the ticketing process. We know it has been discussed, but now you get to hear it from a student's perspective. So we have a few things that we want to discuss. Uh, Evan, though, why don't you really quickly give out the communication lines? Yeah, if you want to get in on this, I know past couple days other WCCP talking heads have talked about it, so we want to hear your perspective. If you want to call in, phone lines wide open, Northland Communication phone line, 864-654-ROAR, that's 7627. Health Dare text line, if you don't feel like talking to us, I don't blame you, 864-986-1566 if you want to text in. So, as we are all aware, the athletic department released an updated ticket policy uh, this week, and they are trying to keep in with the tradition of having free student tickets because the athletic department does not take money from student fees. So, you know, one of the, a statement from their website was, you know, the uniquely Clemson tradition of providing students access to football tickets at absolutely no cost will continue under the new plan as free game tickets will be provided to students in each student section. The new plan now also provides an opportunity for students to purchase a season ticket and students will have more control over the ticketing process. Members of the IPTA Collegiate Club and upperclassmen will continue to receive benefits. And the athletic website, which has been totally redone, I don't know if y'all have Love seen it. that. It's awesome. really, really cool. Very um, well done. Looks very you leave Clemson for the summer and just everything changes. Everything changes. You come Clemson back, there's the bad, sometimes construction, the construction everywhere. Online know. looks different. I don't reckon. But you can't even drive anywhere. They, have, yeah, they, sure have, uh, great de- they go through great detail there, outlining some of the frequently asked questions that I know people certainly have related to the new ticketing policy. See, uh, but some key takeaways that I got from reading over those um, FAQs were that tickers, tickets are fully transfund, transferable, which enables students to freely exchange tickets with other students. That keeps friends together. Yeah, that's you know a big thing. Obviously, going to the football games. Another thing: there's free tickets available in every section, upper deck, lower deck, and it's the good. hill. Yep. And then every seat on the hill is free. So from what I got from listening to Out of Bounds on Thursday, they had Joe Galbraith, the assistant athletic director, I think for communications, he called in and was talking to Kwok and Kelly. And one of the things that he mentioned was that the student government for Clemson, Mason Foley and his whole crew. Yeah, shout out to our boy Mason. Love it. Yeah, uh, Good they, job with him. They kind of spearheaded the whole project and set up meetings with athletics. And it was kind of their brainchild because they wanted to make the hill – Desirable to where because you know we've well that's where the whole the whole problem stemmed from was well, the issue with the hill. Not but you know that we've talked intended. about you know privately about how standing on the hill sometimes is not seen as I mean you don't you'd rather be in the lower deck sometimes that's your versus, first preference versus, yeah but versus I mean hill. it's always nice to be in the hill every now and then I I certainly loved it for the Notre Dame game that's yeah, for sure but their goal here I think is by keeping every seat on the hill free and then having an equal number of tickets that you can purchase for the lower deck and the upper deck and an equal number of tickets in the free lottery system for the upper deck and lower deck. They're trying to kind of find a balance. And Evan, I think you've mentioned a couple times that you like this new system. Yeah, I like that it's a combination of about all three types of ticketing systems. You have the availability to purchase season tickets, so you can pay for tickets. If you don't want to pay for tickets, well, we have a lottery. And if you don't want to do that, we have a first-come, first-served basis. So you basically take every way of student ticketing and put it all together and say, here, if you're not happy with option A, well, guess what? You got option B and option C. So well, I think it covers all the bases. I really like we've it. We've had four different ticketing systems here. Which is ridiculous. Four <laughs> years of undergrad, because I believe the year before we got here was the year that they stopped the camping, where you could stake out a spot. Um, we know John in the back producer is familiar with that system. And obviously, for obvious But he's reasons, not old, though. John's no, not old. No, no, no. no. But, recent. 
for but sure. for obvious reasons, they did. The university probably wasn't happy with that policy because you had kids skipping classes, and you know, for obvious reasons, yeah, they wanted it just to make wasn't, the switch. It wasn't I, something they wanted. I thought our freshman year system was the best by far. I mean, I didn't hear any of issues at all in regards to ticketing or even just for, as as freshmen getting tickets for every game. I was very happy with it. And then sophomore year came around and people started complaining. And the junior by, year was by the your worst. junior year, people were just freaking out. Yeah, junior year, it just didn't seem like there was any rhyme or re. I'm sure there was, but just as a student who. You know, I mean, we're all in none day with when classes are in session for us, it gets extremely hectic. And, you know, sometimes tickets are not on the forefront of our mind. So it's difficult sometimes to balance trying to figure out my your ticketing situation. And this year, Bradley, was the first year this past year what when you had to do your ticket two weeks in advance. Yeah. So Which that threw a lot of people off, especially beginning of the season. Yeah. One of the other things, though, that I thought was interesting that Joe said on Out of Bounds was that. And this is a direct quote. He said, I've been at Clemson for five years, and it was one of the things we talked about my first week. So, obviously, it's something that – and I do know that uh, Dan Radakovich, the athletic director for Clemson, he was approached by the Board of trustee, tr- Trustees back in October to fix the issue because it was during the middle of the season when people started to realize, you know, A, the student section is not full – at the beginning of the game. I think, was, I think it was a Boston College game that really kind of highlighted well, the, hey, this isn't going so well right and now. And that was a, a game that was tied 7-7 in the fourth quarter, and the hill was basically halfway empty. But there were games, and I, I'm not sure which exact one it was, where at kickoff, I mean, you could look, I remember seeing as the, as the players ran down the hill when I was sitting in section B. Too much green. I could see gaps on the opposite side of the hill where the, where the uh, band is. Which is sad for a team that's top five in the nation. I know LSU is calling us out on Twitter about well, the other Death Valley the not is, though, filling up games. Is it was it because a lot of people said is it the students' fault? I mean, there was people saying it's the students' faults. They're not interested. They're entitled. Some people said it was the athletic department's fault for changing policies and not educating the students. Some people said that it was the fire marshal's you know fault because they had an issue with overcrowding. I mean, you know, Bradley. That Notre Dame game and the Louisville game, there too were many people way there. too many people. <laughs> it was great. There. It was a good problem to have, but, but it was probably a little unsafe. But for a safety yeah. issue, you, know, you, you obviously don't want to have that. Well, I think the reason you saw more people on the hill for those two games in particular is because, and this is something that I love Mason and Logan, but the student government can't change this. It's too hot. And standing on the hill, for some reason, is just immensely hotter than being in the lower or upper deck. So I don't think... But those no people matter, out in the stands are hot, too. I mean, it's, but it's just not the hot. same as on the it's, hill. It's different, for sure. It's different. Yeah. It's hotter on the hill. So I don't think, no matter so what they do, it's still not going to... Like, for a noon game, the hill's not going to be as full as so you're So do there need to be policies be. in place where students can get... There needs to be shade structures in yeah, place. Yeah, I mean, is that is that something that they need to invest in, Evan? Are you saying that that's something that they need to change? Well, I mean, how, about, how about no more noon kickoffs? I don't know. Well, that's, that's not going to happen. That'd be nice. That'd be but on that side of the stadium, there's zero shade. At least on the east or on the west side, you've got the Oculus and the, the suites. So you've got a little bit of shade over there. But on the hillside, unless the sun's like directly behind the scoreboard, you don't get any shade over there. And you are standing at a pretty steep angle. So, it, you know, over time after, of course, you get a solid calf work four, yeah, that's for sure. Five yeah, no hours, kidding. you can definitely be sore. But we do have um, a call. We got David who wants to talk to us. So I believe we have him on air now. David, can you hear us? What's up, guys? Hey, how you doing, my man? What's going on? Good. How are y'all? Good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. What do you think of the new student ticket policy? Um, I've taken a, a brief look through it. I uh, obviously got the email yesterday sometime, and <clears throat> it's it's okay. One thing I wish they would do, and I think this is the only time I'll ever say this, is something similar to what South Carolina does for their students is that they reward the kids that go to other sporting events and – there should be some way that, you know, it, you scan your card when you come in and when you leave the game. So, you know, if you're leaving before halftime, you have less of a chance to get a ticket than someone who stays in, you know, for the whole game, for the whole season. I think, um, and I, I just think, I think there needs to be some sort of merit-based system, especially for the postseason games, because you'll get people who don't even go to any of the regular season games get a ticket to, you know, the bowl or the playoff. Um, yeah. Especially now that Clemson's, you know, big time. It's those are games that we want to go to. Oh, it's a, it's an excellent point. I think that's an amazing comparison because I'm sitting here looking at the South Carolina Athletic website um, and their ticketing system. Obviously, it's a rewards program and it's designed to, right. to, to you know reward the students for their support of the athletic teams beyond just football. So by attending home right. games, they can earn reward points that boost their chances of not only receiving football tickets, but you can reach various prizes, including Under Armour gear, which is the uh, 
a company that sponsors their apparel. But you right. earn points by claiming tickets and you attend athletic events. You could do for football, baseball, and basketball. You have to go through the student ticketing process and then scan once you're in the game. But for all the other sports, you just bring your Carolina card, which is the equivalent of our, our Clemson ID, to the venue for entry, right. and then you have it scanned, and then you earn points based off of your attendance. So one point for an SEC game, two points for non-conference, and then you get annual points. So if you're a freshman, you get three points. If you're a sophomore, you get four. Junior is six and well, senior and is if eight. And you, if you wanted to extend that policy, what you could do is reward more points based on the athletic event because more people are going to go to a football game. Give them one point for that. But if you go to like a volleyball game, because let's not kid ourselves, there's not, nearly, yeah, there's not nearly as many people yeah. going to a volleyball Nobody game. To to reward more, more points for those, and then you get more people at every sport. So I, I like that idea, David. Good call. I, I think that Honestly, and South Carolina's I, policy is, is something that Clemson should at least look at. Go ahead, David. Right. I was just going to say, I think one of you, Bradley or Jay, or somebody was touching on about the weather being an issue, and I agree, you know, but, you know, how, how do you think the players feel? You know, they're down there, some of the bench players, they're not even playing, and they're standing in the heat in full gear. So I think the least we can do as fans is ride it out till the fourth quarter. You know, I get the the noon games against Furman and SC State. I get it; it's hard, but you know they they've got to sit there and they've got to play the game. So at the least we can do a show. Well, maybe at the, maybe at the top or the bottom of the hill, they should install those giant misting fans to blow on the students too. That'll help yeah, cool us go. down. For sure. And I'll tell you what, that home schedule this year is not going to help that whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, David, that's one thing I wanted to talk about with you. Do you feel like the home schedule this year in particular makes th- it, you know the effectiveness of this new policy challenging like is it going to be difficult to fill the hill regardless just based off of who we're playing i could see it being an issue um with the hill i mean i just think you know you sit on the hill and you're like everybody says sit on the hill and once you sit there you're like why i mean this is especially those noon games it's so hot yeah i'd agree and i think during the, the night games you know it's not the best family atmosphere um, everybody's been out all day and, you know, the kids get kind of, kind of raucous, but you know, the Hill is just tough and it's, it's, it's a part of, it's a part of the that's... Clemson tradition, but like right. you brought up, there are some undesirable attributes to it that make it, you know, difficult sometimes right. for you. If, if you're, ha- if you're weighing between sitting in section A or section B or even in the upper deck, cause I mean, you, you know, I know not everybody wants to sit that high up, but you you can get a pretty good yeah. vantage point of the game from the upper deck. And lots of times sitting from that vantage point on the Hill, as I'm sure, you know, all of us have done it at some point, you really can't, your depth perception is, you know, skewed. You can't really see what's going on yeah. past the, the 50 yard line, but you're still going to have students oh, that want to sit sure. there. I mean, I, it's, I, I sat in the upper deck for the Georgia Tech game in 2006 when it was homecoming. Spiller's big game, breakout game. And that was one of the best games I've ever been to. And you you have a great – we had a great view of the double juke that Spiller put on those two senior defensive backs. And I, I like sitting in the upper deck. It's, it's not bad. It's yeah, I think – and I, I think – I enjoy it more. I think, Dave – yeah, I think you're right, David. We appreciate you calling in. Good stuff from you. Yeah, there, thanks pal. for calling in, David. We appreciate um, it. I yeah, think, thanks, guys. Y'all yeah. do a great job. Thank you. We appreciate it. I think David does make a good point, though, and John was smiling in the back as he was talking about C.J. Spiller because I'm sure John was at that game, too. But, again, John's not old. But I think <laughs> I think that's a good point, and I think that's what's going to help put people, at least in the upper deck. But as far as the ticketing problem, I don't think it was the upper deck that was really the concern. It was kind of the hill. It was the majority of the hill. Yeah. yeah. So, well, the hill was the most visible. I mean, not a, you're not going to always turn around and look at the upper deck. Well, because you know were, there's not as many people up there anyway. Well, there you're was, not worried about how many there people were still, in the upper deck. There were still games where the upper deck was just as sparse as the hill. So yeah, I, but that's not as big of a problem, though. Because That's the also, lower the yeah. lower bowl it's still, needs to be no, full. No, no, no. It is a problem because it's still student. It's attendance. not the same as the hill, though. It doesn't matter. It's it does. still student. No, it's still student well, attendance. Okay. Well, that's you why don't be- have students showing up to the upper deck. You don't have students showing up to the hill. You don't have the people, lower deck. You don't have still. regular people showing up to the upper deck either. Check you, the other side, the general population upper deck. It's never full. And, and, and where does the camera show the most? Where does the camera show the most? The, oh, the hill I get it. When the tigers run down the hill, you want the hill to be full. But my point is, it is more of an. It's more than just oh, the hill is empty. It is an overall problem with either the ticketing or the students because you had kids that weren't showing up to other sections besides just the hill. Right, but the source, the root of the problem, what really started it was how empty the hill was. Nobody looked up at the upper deck and thought, wow, that upper deck is empty. Let's change the ticketing process. It was, holy crap, there is nobody on the and hill right the now in the middle of this game. We and need people on the hill. Nobody paid attention until the hill was empty. Nobody yeah. cared about the problem until the and hill I, started being empty. And I love David's point about maybe incentivizing staying the entire game because you do get yeah. a lot of people, even yeah. in the lower deck, that will leave at halftime 
even for a big time game, i.e. J. Smith, NC State 20, 2016. But yeah, I wide, mean, is that the wide right game? That was the wide right. <laughs> game. Yeah, wide right game. <laughs> Who didn't see that? But yeah, I, I think that'd be a great move. I think that's the, the probably the only thing we can emulate with South Carolina's athletic program right now would be that policy, and it's what Central Spirit does. And so it seems, is this seems is this new policy well. at the end of the day? Is this new policy going to do what Clemson Deputy Director of Athletics Graham Neff said, where they want to get tickets into the hands of the kids that are most passionate about going to the game? Is this the new policy that's going to accomplish that? I think it's got a good chance to be. I think right now, if you compare it to the other ones. I I think that probably gives us the best chance. But like you said, the home schedule might not accomplish that this year. I think in the future that you'll see this tend to work. Does the fact that you now have kids who can buy season tickets, does that financially divide the student base? No, I, I like the fact that it offers three different uh, options. I think you're going to probably have students that are going to want to do that, especially freshmen, probably not yeah. knowing any better. Freshmen They're going will, to want to they'll just come in and they'll. Sorry. Without without the seniority priority, you're yeah. going to want to have freshmen just lock up their. There season will be kids who will year. buy the season pass just for the South Carolina game, oh, just yeah. for I the mean, peace of mind. Of financially, knowing, that might actually make sense. Yeah, I'm going to the South Carolina game in the lower deck or, or wherever they want to sit. Yeah, so I think in the future you'll see this tend to work. Maybe not this year, but it'll even itself out. It'll be it'll be interesting. I mean, you got any final thoughts on on the ticketing process as a whole, or you just feel like everything's going to go back to peaches and rose, it's, peaches and ice cream? It's good. I like it. Now you make me want ice cream. <laughs> well, it's, we're, we're, it's lunchtime. We're hungry. I'm, just, I'm, I'm a simple man. Give me football and ice cream, and I'll pretty much be happy. Well, it has been a lot of fun bringing you this edition of After Further View. Uh, thanks, as always, to John in the back. He does a great job for us. And we hopefully will be back this same time next week. Talk some more college football with Let you. Let it be known, Evan sucks at flipping water bottles. <laughs> this water bottle doesn't have enough water we'll in it right now. Time. I 